According to the media, HEFKE, the university's funding body, recently decreed that government is to stop funding pointless university research, forcing academics to prove that their academic inquiry has some relevance to the real world. Universities will have to show their research influences the economy, public policy, or society. My academic life, it seems, has been wasted. <laughs> I've moved from one pointless discipline, anthropology, to cultural and media studies, purportedly the pinnacles of pointlessness. Before I become overly depressed, it dawned that, according to this insular definition, uh, much of what we do at SOAS is pointless. Not the school is entirely unused to its special expertise being dismissed. Famously, at the start of the Second World War, it highlighted the lack of linguists, for example, in Japanese, only to be ignored by the foreign and war offices with dire consequences. In the light of events in Afghanistan and Iraq, plus ça change. Why should the study of the media arouse such excitement? Classically, citizenship assumed literacy. And how can you be a functioning subject in a modern polity if you do not understand how media work? The inherently problematic nature of communication has exercised minds since Socrates and Augustine. Nor are media transparent. Consider how Locke and Marx wrestled with money as a medium. Apart from unmediated divine revelation, all knowledge is mediated by texts, images, language, and so on. The recognition that even logical signs were neither neutral nor transparent drove Charles Sanders' purse to invent semiotics. On what grounds, then, are we to assume, say, for development studies or politics, that the media are neutral and transparent? Television news arguably resembles masculine soap opera and reiterates the worldview of a particular class. As John Fisk put it, Objectivity is the unauthored voice of the bourgeoisie. We start to see why so many people assert that communication and mediation are unproblematic and have to denigrate media studies. As J.K. Galbraith remarked, faced with the choice between changing one's mind and proving there is no need to do so, almost everybody gets busy on the proof. Try going for a week without access to any media, print, broadcast, internet, or mobile phone, and the modern subject swiftly becomes disoriented. To address these issues, if I may, in an inaugural lecture, I shall draw on my own career and how, after working as an anthropologist on Bali, I came to be defrocked, and to embrace those flighty twin disciplines of cultural and media studies. By cultural studies, I mean the theoretical movement traced to Gramsci and Althusser as exemplified in the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. Many disciplines claim to own or contribute uniquely to media studies. The versions that interest me derive from cultural studies, literary and anthropological approaches. Until recently, anthropologists have tended to downplay their people's involvement with modern mass media. We now see if our mass media here, uh, AV, oh, it works, great. Gary Larson, uh, it took a popular cartoonist, Gary Larson, to make the point. As a well-indoctrinated anthropologist, for years I managed to ignore how far Bali and Balinese self-understandings had long been constituted through the mass media. Quite how we appreciate the ways people engage with media is complex, as are the ways they're implicated in people's lives. In this sense of articulating the known and lived world, the mass media and film are anything but trivial. At times, in unlikely guises, the media can be perceptive commentators on trends. Andrew Davis's 1986 cult BBC satire, from which my title is taken, elegantly anticipated the contortions required of British universities under Thatcherism. And they had a particularly venal uh, uh, vice chancellor, who, uh, when in doubt, I think of Paul. Uh, here, my title is a predicate in search of a subject, and the subject changes a bit as we go along. Before arguing that the pursuit of knowledge is for its own sake, how adequate a response is this in 2010? What is researchable and what counts as acceptable outcomes are heavily constrained now directly through funding 
and less directly through institutional pressures. Nor are the ends themselves necessarily so pure. Area studies and other disciplines had been co-opted by governments long before they were invoked to counter the perceived threat of terrorism, for which read Islam. So perhaps it's time to reflect on the big question. What is knowledge for? Fortunately for you, and perhaps me, this occasion is supposed to be more general and entertaining. So I shall confine myself to a narrower issue. For whom is this knowledge? Specifically, for Indonesia, how did the island of Bali, notorious for its warlike population, come to be reimagined as both an erotic and an artistic paradise on earth? And what has come over Indonesian television since Suharto's resignation in 1998? How have anthropologists addressed the question, for whom is knowledge about Bali? Coincidentally and conveniently, some of the discipline's most illustrious figures worked there. In their study of Balinese character, Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead argued that Balinese culture is, in many ways, less like our own than any other which has yet been recorded. It is also a culture in which the ordinary adjustment of the individual approximates in form the sort of maladjustment which, in our own cultural setting, we call schizoid. Schizophrenic. Balinese unproblematically were the object of study to further our knowledge for ourselves. As Bateson was British and Mead American, who is our here? Uncritically imagined Westerners? Balinese mothers, and mothers always are, were of course to blame because they borrowed babies to tease their own children, which induced the emotional detachment that Mead regarded as distinctive of Balinese. They did not consider asking they, their subjects what they thought they were doing. When a Balinese psychiatrist finally inquired, the Balinese explained they were simply teaching their children how to control jealousy and anger. Now, one reason Mead found Balinese withdrawn was that they were too courteous to tell her that she resembled the dreaded queen of witches, Rangda. <laughs> and they fled in horror at the sight of her. So much for ethnographic reflexivity. Does that flagship of cultural approaches, interpretive anthropology, fare better? Its doyen, Clifford Geertz, admitted that his best-known book, Nagara, the Theatre State in 19th century Bali, was a history of Bali for us. Geertz's vision was of a theatre state in which the kings and princes were the impresarios, the priests, the directors, and the peasants, the supporting cast, stage crew, and audience. The stupendous, uh, the stupendous cremations, tooth filings, temple dedications, pilgrimages and blood sacrifices, mobilizing hundreds and even thousands of people and great quantities of wealth were not means to political ends. They were the ends themselves. They were what the state was for. Power served pomp, not pomp power. This familiar image of Southeast Asian symbolic kingship was only achievable by ignoring the evidence. As the historian Adrian Vickers put it, these kings might equally be described as warlords, slave traders, thugs, organized gangsters. Anyway, whose idea of theater is this? Geertz blithely imported a 20th century Euro-American account with replete, replete with all its associations. He never considered whether Balinese might have their own ideas about theater, which happened to be quite different. Anthropologists argue their sensitivity in addressing cultural difference through ethnography underwrites their authority to enunciate about others. As regards the most famous scholars on Bali, we have a problem. Not only is the pursuit of knowledge overwhelmingly for the benefit of the pursuers, but to achieve this, the subjects of study and at times the evidence have to be ignored. When antique dealers examine, say, a period table, I'm told they don't look at its polished surface, but turn it upside down to see how it was made. When considering knowledge of others, perhaps we should look not just at discipline's claims, but at their practices. It takes some agility, if not sophistry, to invest ethnographers with such authority. 
when their grasp of language, history, and the complexity of societies like Bali is necessarily fairly rudimentary. However, when Nigel Bali in The Innocent Anthropologist spelled out what doing ethnography is usually like, coals of fire were heaped on his head. Often, as I know to my cast, the ethnographer resembles less a hero than a small child struggling to speak and understand what's going on. Let me clarify how practice is relevant with some examples. During my first field research, while collecting genealogies, anthropologists always collect genealogies, I was puzzled by the fact that bribe givers and bribe takers often gave starkly different accounts of what happened. For example, by parental arrangement, by family agreement, by alonement, or by, or by capture, which actually happens. Stupidly, I set about trying to establish which version was true, by which of the natives had got it wrong, and it struck me that culture was less a set of collective representations to which people adhered or not than, as the cultural studies scholar Stuart Hall put it, a site of struggle. Anthropology is committed to some version of culture as a coherent whole. By contrast, the philosopher behind cultural studies, Ernest de la view, seems more apposite, that usage and contingency make society as a structure or system impossible. More humbling was the unintended consequence of shaving and showering in the mornings in Bali. Nearby, the family I lived with worked, chatted with visitors, and watched television. It was hard not to overhear them, and one is very sensitive in, at that stage in the morning. What was frightening was that day after day, virtually nothing they said was illuminated by the voluminous literature on Balinese cultural society. What anthropologists, and indeed others, wrote about Bali had precious little to do with how Balinese talked among themselves or about what. The irrelevance of my supposed knowledge was at least as galling as being informed that my academic discipline is pointless. It's also worth briefly recounting how I was forced to appreciate the importance of the mass media. During previous field trips, I'd held open house and recorded the lively arguments that ensued each evening. By the late 80s, however, nobody was turning up. When I investigated, I discovered my former interlocutors glued to Balney's theatre on Picard television. Television had become integral to how Balney's understood and engaged with the world about them. Now, Bali is slightly unusual. The island was famous even before Westerners knew it existed. It's not quite as contradictory as it may sound. Renaissance Europeans thought that Eden was not transcendent, but some remote place yet to be discovered. So, when the explorer Cornelius de Houtman returned from a voyage to the East Indies in 1597, the news spread throughout Europe that the search was over. They'd finally found paradise. The island became the object of European dreams of exotic otherness, sometimes idyllic, sometimes savage. Stamford Raffles enthused about the noble Balinese compared to the indolent Javanese. And the drunken German Sanskritist Friedrich found Brahmanical literature. That's all right. So Bali was promptly branded an outpost of Hindu civilization in a sea of Mohammedanism. On the other hand, Balinese were notorious as slave raiders and warriors and ferociously resisted all attempts at conquest. When the Dutch finally invaded in 1906-8, the European uh, newspaper stories and photographs of the massacres and looting, that's an actual photograph, became a cause célèbre. It's one of the first instances of the, the mass media starting to affect politics after the Boer War. Many Balinese Rajas, their families and followers, committed mass suicide rather than surrender. Needless to say, there are contrasting representations of what occurred. Here is the French version. In a brilliant exercise in public relations, the Dutch promptly rebranded the site of this carnage as a Garden of Eden. And by 1914, the steamship companies had started to issue tourist brochures. This is a still from the uh, Dutch shipping company. Bali became the place for the international glitterati. Among the musicians, artists, and playboys who visited or stayed, perhaps a special mention should go to the musician and artist, Walter Spies, 
who had close links to the German artistic movement in Hellerau. Spies settled in Bali and set about creating a school of Balinese painting and a style of imagining the island. Not only were, the, were celebrities such as Charlie Chaplin, Noel Card, Elie Beinhorn, and Barbara Woolworth Hutton offered Spies's view of Bali, but so were scholars like Bateson and Mead. Most histories of the period represent Europeans as sowing creative seed into the fecund but largely passive native imagination. Barney's accounts, by contrast, dwell on how they realize that foreigners, the new Rajas, as one old Raja put it to me, wanted art. As Barney's had no idea that what they did was called art, they went off to find a cultural broker, which ended with them enticing Spies to Bali. The 1920s and 1930s became an extraordinary effervescent period for the arts, with royal power sufficiently weakened as to enable ordinary Balinese to participate, sometimes unwittingly. To Puritan Americans and war-weary decadent Europeans, Bali offered obvious attractions. Poor young Balinese mostly went about topless. Visitors rushed into print and later celluloid, to spawn a minor global industry in which erotica featured large. I confine myself to one of the the many European photographers, the aptly named Fleischmann. (laughs) While such images have now mostly disappeared, Dutch artists flocked to paint Balinese women, a market which still flourishes in Balinese hands. There were some photos and paintings of males, of which more anon. Nowhere were these cultural encounters acted acted out more intriguingly than in dance. At the Paris Exposition in 1931, the commentators enthused about young female dancers. It was as if bas reliefs of celestial nymphs at Angkor had come to life. Famously, These performances revolutionized Artaud's ideas and set him about revolutionizing Western theater. Later, Indonesian nationalists like Sudar Sono argued the ancient pedigree of Balinese dance was performed between 2,500 to 1,000 years ago. The epitome was Legong, the dance of the virgins, as one film title put it, which is now the brand image of Bali, indeed sometimes Indonesia. Supposedly, an 18th century prince dreamed of heavenly nymphs dancing and ordered his imaginations to be choreographed. However, we actually have little evidence of dance in Bali much before the 1920s. Tourists expected the natives to dance, and the Balinese obliged. By extrapolating from theater or ritual and by inventing new works to order. Legon probably took its present form, danced first by prepubescent boys, then later girls, in the late 1920s. The stories reflect Balney's Shaivite enthusiasm with violence. The dance you just saw from the Mahabharata, uh, there Abhimanyu is dying of a hundred arrows shot by the Karawa. The, afterwards, at the reception, we have another video about a Legon, again from the Mahabharata, uh, and that dwells on the beheading of Drona and the disemboweling of Karna with Arjuna drinking his blood. This did, of course, little to inhibit Balinese dancing girls becoming part of a sanitized Euro-American imagination, exemplified in perhaps the most famous Balinese dance ever, complete with Thai-style headdress, slit skirt, and high heels. <laughs> Flowers outside my room. I'll watch the path that winds by the wishing tree. It ends beneath my window, and there I'll be. That winds by the wishing tree It ends beneath my window And there I'll be 
And there I'll wait for the love I longed for. What can one say? If Meyerbeer's L'Africaine presented an exotic East to the haute bourgeoisie, the road to Bali made it cozy to the masses, a.k.a. small-town America. That's what Bob Hope and Bing Crosby are doing there. Legon has come to embody the ultimate fantasy of feminine mystery and allure. Vickers noted that, as Meade saw it, when Balinese men sought sexual partners, they looked for the little dancing girl. The dancing girl turned into the Rangda witch. The interest in small girls and boys was not unconnected to Bali's status as a haven for paedophiles. In 1939, Bateson and Mead testified in vain at Spies' trial on charges of sex with underage boys, while the Canadian musicologist Colin McPhee fled Bali before he could be arrested on a similar charge. It may not be coincidental that many expatriate servants became leading figures in the Indonesian revolution against the Dutch. The relationship of Westerners and Balinese was profoundly asymmetrical. After the revolution, Sukarno's turbulent times and the massacre of supposed communists in 1965-66, the New Order government capitalized on Bali's international image by developing a major tourist industry there. Now, some 4 million people a year visit an island 100 kilometers by 150 with only some 3.5 million inhabitants. The people whom Raffles described as interested in war and its instruments rather than the arts have reinvented themselves largely in terms of somebody else's consumerist fantasies. The Indonesian Institute of Arts produces an elite cadre of dancers increasingly for the tourist market. And the provincial government holds an annual international arts festival. The most expensive features are sundratari, mass ballets, which Sukarno is said to have encouraged after seeing Saint Lumière in Egypt. In a neat caricature of his successor uh, Suharto's new order regime, the actors are silent and only the narrator speaks. To see these events as spectacles begs both questions of what the producers hope to achieve 
and how audiences appreciate them. Margaret Mead once said the only way to research somewhere like Bali was to be parachuted in with no prior knowledge. While this highlights an anthropological dilemma, such denial smacks of despair. And so far, the answer to the question for whom is knowledge seems overwhelmingly in favor of those with academic, political, and economic muscle. And yet, as the burgeoning of local broadcast media suggests, matters may not be quite so simple. Is the only relevant knowledge academic? What about people's understandings of their own society? John Ellis argued, I quote, cinema and broadcast TV work over the meaning that modern society gives itself, the web of definitions and suppositions that gives sense to the world. Broadcast TV is the private life of the nation state, defining the intimate and inconsequential sense of everyday life forgotten quickly and incomprehensible to anyone outside its scope. Given the limits of academic knowledge, perhaps we should not steer, sneer at the study of such public discussion. As a vast archipelago, television has been crucial to national development and to creating a sense of nation, which is why Indonesia launched one of the first civilian satellites in 1976. The government placed a television set, car, bat uh, car battery powered where necessary, in every village, right up into the highlands of Irian. As it set out to involve its sprawling population in the idea that they were Indonesians. By 2008, besides a burgeoning print media and radio, over half the population had mobile phone subscriptions. However, with two-thirds of households able to access it, and with its high political and public profile, television is the mass medium par excellence. Under Suharto's military dictatorship, television was uh, tightly censored and effectively a branch of the Department of Information. This ended abruptly with the riots of 1998 when commercial stations ignored orders and broadcast riots and the shooting of student protesters. While media freedoms remain contested, with Muslim conservatives pushing through an anti-pornography bill, Indonesia must now have one of the least effectively regulated media in Asia. If television is indeed the private life of the nation, then Indonesia has a vibrant, raucous, and at times surprising private life. With over 10 uh, national terrestrial stations, a range of television channels, and some 140 local television stations, Indonesian television production is diverse. As television is an industrial product, much is formulaic. Genre have been copied or adapted from the USA and other countries where producers have trained. However, the sharp drop in the rupiah's value during the economic crisis in the 90s made imports prohibitively expensive, and coupled with lighter regulation, encouraged experimentation. While Cinetron, elect electronic cinema, a portmanteau term covering soap operas, action, and mythological series, carried on, other genres disappeared or were created. News reporting, hidebound under Suharto, had to find new formats. Banned political talk shows mushroomed, then gradually dwindled, as audiences grew bored of endless talk. Reality TV caught on to the producer's delight because programs required little investment or expertise. As the most successful top national rating, we're talking many, many millions, the chase was on for new formats and attractive presenters. An unintended consequence was that young, well-educated, articulate and elegant women came to dominate in many genres. It is the argument, at times implicit, at times explicit, between these programs at which I wish to look briefly. A rival standby is hidden camera shows, especially involving pranks. While these are a global format, what is significant is how these are culturally inflected. Most Indonesia's knowledge of foreigners is as rich, superior, expatriate businessmen. So the series Bule Gila, literally Mad Albinos, shortened to Bugil Naked, uh, consisted of Westerners playing ridiculous and transgressive roles. Here, an Australian and Englishman are being trained by a transsexual before begging as street minstrels. 
white men as buffoons or worse stand in stark contrast to their conventional, uh, uh, to the, uh, stand in stark counterpoint to their conventional colonial and current news images. After 32 years of doctored news coverage, viewers had become skeptical and turned off. To up their ratings, the Surabaya-based Surya Chitra television decided to include sensational crime in their news reporting. Soon, every channel had two or more daily real-life crime programs fronted by glamorous presenters whose style and class was remote from that of most perpetrators. Each channel gave its individual stamp from the down market, La TV's aptly named Brutal, to the upmarket trans TV with Lachak on the trail and Mananti Ajar, more and on, awaiting death or the day of judgment. The latter two explored the background to violent crimes, as in these screenshots I show you from Lachak's coverage of an apparently motiveless murder from about three streets away from where I was living, of an elderly couple in Jogjakarta, that's the police photograph, mixed with reconstructions. Mananti Ajal went further and sent a young Jakartan journalist to remote parts of the archipelago to research capital crimes and interview condemned murderers and their families. This included her sitting in their cells, eating with them and so on before flying back to Jakarta. The credits rolled to shots of the killers and their locations and the journalist invariably playing a white grand piano in some luxurious location, here involving a flower bed. If I told you about that without showing a clip, you wouldn't have believed me. <laughs> it also, uh, if you can manage to listen to yesterday in the future without thinking of that, I'd be surprised. <laughs> Watching, rather than just dismissing such programs, raises questions, at times disturbing, about what is going on in mass culture. Examined closely, broadcasting highlights social contradictions. Elite or upper-middle-class Indonesians, often internationally educated, devise programs ostensibly for the masses, with whom they have little acquaintance. In one sense, crime programs are rights of class, which expose the lives of the poor to public gaze. However, such coverage also reveals how others live and think, and so may not simply reinforce but potentially unsettle existing stereotypes. While local television can focus on less heterogeneous audiences and involve locals in creating popular culture, national television is differently positioned. By its nature, it produces mass culture and is also required to interpolate its viewers as Indonesians. Yet, Indonesia comprises several hundred languages and societies with adherents of all the major religions. To assume, say, that television addresses Javanese and Muslims as they are the most populous groupings is too simple. We need to examine practices of production and decision-making of different media corporations. Replying to critics, Ishadi, CEO of TransTV, who also had a media degree, made two points. 
Firstly, most commercial broadcasting is pitched at middle-class viewers because they have the disposable income. So, are they supposed to be gullible? Second, critics imported their own class preconceptions in presupposing the masses to be infinitely gullible and stupid. The vehemence with which Indonesian and foreign intellectuals dismiss such broadcasting overlooks the extent to which they have, uh, they have They've ignored what mass culture recognizes, at least in part. That is a rich history of cultural representations of violence and the complexities of class. What is less remarked upon is how scholars attempt to preempt the way that people understand and engage with mass media like television. Such accounts conveniently omit the whole question of what audiences make of what they watch and so reiterate a singularly myopic view. One genre which attracted both the largest audience share at the time and the most opprobrium is delightfully Indonesian. Supernatural reality shows, or mystic. These vary from explorations of the occult to playing practical jokes for hidden cameras, to volunteers undergoing ordeals, being put in the dark in a place with the sound of a loudly ticking clock all night. Um, it was an entire genre called Dunya Line, the other world, devoted to that. It was not long, however, before other programs had fun. From ghost street singing, and they come along and people go, ah, to helping to push broken down cars at night, and in one, a man turns and sees a ghost beside him and just completely passes out for several hours. We need to show you one. In Paranoid, which lives up or down to its name, the victims are set up. The screaming at the beginning is from the program. <laughs> Again, I'm not making it up. <laughs> While Europeans, and I expect many of you, tend to find such programs cruel, my Javanese friends look at them quite differently and describe them as an important cultural lesson in class, detachment, learning to accept the good and bad and the terrifying indifferently. So this is cultural education. Among the most long-lasting was Pamburu Hantu, literally ghost hunters or ghostbusters. In live broadcasts, ustas, exotically dressed Muslim religious figures, would grapple with ghosts, jinn, and other spirits in people's houses while if, and, uh, before eventually capturing them in soft drinks bottles. <laughs> Meanwhile, another triply blindfolded ustas would draw these apparitions, which for some reason always looked like hairy Dutchmen for the householders invariably to confirm the uncanny likeness. Uh, let's have a look at Pemburu Hunt. Apakah prosesi persiapan awal yang akan segera dilakukan oleh tim? Nampaknya di sini memang cukup berat sekali. Bisa anda saksikan juga kicilik yang berada di bawah tempat. Banyak sekali, jadi kita tidak bisa berpatokan kepada tadi yang sudah ditangkap, tapi ternyata banyak sekali yang berkumpul di sini. Ini ada sekitar tiga ya, yang sudah masuk ke dalam lingkaran uh, energi tim ya. Dan Alhamdulillah, insya Allah. 
Insya Allah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, udah berhasil diatasi. Pak, oh, banyak sekali serangan dari belakang ini, Pak. Tarik dari mana nih, Mas? Ini nih serangan ya, tadi serangan ya. Tadi mencoba menyerangnya ada, ada sosok jin besar juga, nah ini, asap roh jin. Nah ini. Berapa besar sih, Mas, sampai semua? Mudah-mudahan untuk penonton dapat memberikan bantuan doanya kepada tim. Dan ini seluruh tim coba sedang melakukan pengobatan terhadap Ustadz Syarif ya insya Allah mudah-mudahan Allah berikan kesembuhan bagi Ustadz Syarif insya Allah. Bilang bahwa selain dari sosok yang ada di sini juga itu tadi banyak sekali serangan-serangan uh, dari luar gitu ya. seluruh asap-asap uh, atau kabut-kabut hitam ya ya Allah ya Rob mudah-mudahan Allah memberikan Allah angkat kesembu uh, Allah angkat penyakitnya dan Allah berikan kesembuhan dan serta perlindungan kepada hamba-hambanya ini insya Allah amin amin ya Rob these shows including scenes of possession calls, caused outrage among the more religiously devout Ghost Hunters, for example, contains, as those of you who know Islam, many, uh, uh, Arabic, know many, contains many Islamic invocations. The programmer's response was to end broadcast with authorities from different religions, each coming, each coming on the show and arguing the events portrayed did not contradict the respective religious teachings. Such carnivalesque treatment of religion, especially Islam, eventually pr provoked a new genre, Islamic piety programs ranging from depictions of the rewards of the faithful in heaven, which were rather boring, to much more exciting, the awful fate of sinners. From Azab Homosexual, the punishment for homosexuality, this is what happens when homosexuals, seen here having a good time before they know what's going to happen, die. Their corpses immediately emit immense quantities of pus and strange worm-like things. They're a bit more like cigars. Um, and their corpses stink so badly nobody can get near. Such programs mostly met an unfavorable reception and gave way to charity shows where, to hidden cameras, mendicants tested people's generosity. That was Islam in action. It is another genre, however, that has captured and so far held the attention of both the public and politicians. Launched in 2007, Republic Nimpi, the dreaming country, or fantasy republic, parodied the most senior government figures, past presidents, and how decisions are actually made behind closed doors. I'd love to know that at SOAS. The depictions so lacked the customary indirectness and obsequiousness that the Minister of Communication threatened to take it off the air. And the then Vice President, who you'll see in a moment, Yusuf Kala, was so outraged that allegedly he arranged for the actor who played him to be arrested for fraud. It didn't last long. Such intervention backfired spectacularly because ratings soared still further as the actors skillfully turned it to highlight political fixing to an enthusiastic national audience. With elements of the daily show, the thick of it, and spitting images, with lookalikes, not latex, the programs mix reconstructions, commentary, and interrogation about current political events. While actors impersonate public figures, real politicians also take part, neatly blurring the lines between actuality and parody. From one of the spin-offs, Negri Impian, Dreamland, here are first stills of actual political leaders and then their on-screen counterparts. The more exciting stuff I couldn't give you because it needed too much translation, but here is a sample.
sebelah papa ada yang sedang asik sendiri. <tuh> ada apa ya pak ya? Tawa <tuh> 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 Uh, what happened, honey? Bagaimana kabarnya, Pak Wapres? Alhamdulillah. Kabar AA baik-baik saja. Pak Wapres, by the way, uh, kunci yang Bapak pegang itu kunci mobil baru yang diberikan kepada Bapak saat peresmian mobil ya, Pak ya? <laughs> Anda ini tahu saja, ya lumayan buat kenang-kenangan. So what? The less interesting question is what effect, if any, do such programs have on mass audiences? Most Indonesians are openly cynical about their political masters. What is significant, I think, is that the critically inclined are offered public recognition of their judgment, while the judgment of the politically committed is publicly questioned. In Java and Bali, actors are widely considered intellectuals, and historically, theater is a recognized mode of social and political criticism. A senior Indonesian diplomat told me privately that the present president and ministers are now acutely sensitive about how their actions will appear when parodied before audiences used to such work of interpretation. What does this tell us about whom knowledge is for? Is it how Indonesian elites imagine media works on the masses? That, however, assumes meanings can adequately be determined by a study of production and producers. Readers and viewers are presumed passive, relevant only as numbers, or effectively absent. This standard elite vision of knowledge is contradicted at almost every point by ethnographic studies of audiences. Most theories, including Gramsci's hegemony, presuppose at the least some kind of acceptance on the part of the ruled. The idea that viewers are feral and so knowledge, meaning, and opinion partly uncontrollable is deeply threatening. Because we cannot know individually about large populations, the industry and scholars have declared audiences only important insofar as they are domesticable and knowable. The logic is impeccably false. Audience research is the bath plug of communication studies and other quantitative approaches, Seize hold of it, and the comfortable warm water drains away, leaving you very naked. Have I, though, not confirmed the suspicion that media studies is still pointless? Entertaining, perhaps, but trivial. Curious assumptions lurk beneath this argument. We are to believe that scholars and men of action are concerned with how structures determine. The rest is talk, feminine and peripheral, exemplified in soap operas. Part of the issue is historical. How in the 19th century, mass uh, culture became associated with women, while real authentic culture remained the prerogative of men. Equally, our associations of entertainment with the democratic, vulgar, easy owe much to Molière's defense of theater against the church, smart salon, and art critics. As Richard Dyer pointed out, entertainment rejects the claims of morality, politics, and aesthetics in a culture which still accords these high status. It is born of a society that both considers leisure and pleasure to be secondary and even inferior to the businesses of producing and reproducing work and family, and yet invests much energy, desire, and money into promoting them. You might be uninterested in what engages people, what articulates their lived worlds, and how media expand and frame public commentary about events and persons. But you have to be pretty single-minded to ignore one of the world's largest industries. In short, media are a crucial part of any society, not least its public commentary, in this instance, Indonesia. 
A final question. How well can media and cultural studies deal with non-Western media? Mass communications operating with Eurocentric categories faces a major problem. Confined to a macro level, it cannot address situated practice. And in effect, it can only imagine others' media in its own terms. Cultural studies, as a relative newcomer, aims to address the gaps in older disciplines with a more theoretically sophisticated account of how culture is disseminated through the mass media. However, its sense of culture remains closely tied to certain Anglo-American intellectual debates, and it has yet re really to come to grips with the issues posed by difference. I mean, cultural difference. This is where the disciplines and regional expertise of the school become crucial in offering alternatives to the existing hegemony. So, is the answer ecumenical rapprochement between rival disciplines? A cultural studies sensitive to difference promises well. However, there are obstacles which require recognition if we are to overcome them. Kuhn's, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, noted the central role of scholars' intellectual practices. What should be sweetness and light in theory may turn out to be trench warfare. Or else there is mutual denial, as between British cultural studies and French post-structuralism. My liminal status between anthropology and cultural and media studies has made me an accidental ethnographer of their intellectual practices. The differences in how they run seminars and conferences or engage with colleagues is fascinating. Even within departments, mass communications, cultural studies, and practice-oriented streams define their object of, objects of study differently, invoke different intellectual genealogies, and advocate different research practices, known grandly as methodology. The stress upon what is essential or structural at the expense of the contingent and contextual means that the serious study of practice has barely begun. However, as Foucault noted, if you look behind the grand claims, the critical scholar examining the history of reason learns that it was born in an altogether reasonable fashion from chance. Devotion to truth and the precision of scientific methods arose from the passion of scholars, their reciprocal hatred, their fanatical and unending discussions, and their spirit of competition, the personal conflict that slowly forged the weapons of reason. It seems there is still forging to be done. This ceaseless pro process of questioning and argument, like the ritual we are participating in today, culminating in the forthcoming ordeal by SOAS Wine, reinforces the stereotype that universities are out of touch with the real world. What needs interrogating, though, is how a cozy neoliberal dream of consumer capitalism has been naturalized, not least through the mass media. Consider the political and financial elite's recent antics in defending a manifestly unsustainable and dangerous modus operandi. To point the figure at academia distracts attention from far more serious and peculiar practices. Thank you.